Dr. Rubenstein is the director of the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship and part of the Swedish Family Medicine First Hill faculty. She has indicated that this gives her the opportunity to work with the wonderful people in the city that she loves. Um, so real dedication to this um, work that she does. She enjoys caring for patients of all ages, but has a particular affinity for older adults. She's excited to share this passion as we train our family medicine residents and geriatric medicine fellows. In light of our rapidly aging population, understanding best practices in geriatric care is essential knowledge for the family physician. Dr. Rubenstein grew up in New Jersey and went to college at the University of Michigan. She says, go blue. <laughs> She returned to her home state for medical school at Robert Wood Johnson Medical School at Rutgers University, and she did a residency at Swedish for Skill and stayed on to complete the Geriatric Medicine Fellowship and then practiced for eight years at Carolyn Downs Family Medical Center, a community health center in Seattle Central District as a full spectrum family physician. She says that she's energized by working with residents and fellows and was ex delighted to return to Swedish um, directing an interprofessional geriatric assessment clinic, a referral-based service where physician, social work, pharmacy, nursing, and psychology trainees and faculty work together to evaluate complex older adults in function, cognition, and care planning. And we're so pleased to have her again talk to us about caring for the caregiver. She's got tremendous expertise and um, great resources to share with you. Thanks so much for coming, Dr. Rubenstein. Oh, it is my pleasure to be here. Really delighted um, to talk to you about this topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart. This, this topic is always important for us to think about and talk about and perhaps never more important than during this uh, now long, uh, year long COVID-19 pandemic that has disproportionately affected older adults and people who care for them. And while this talk won't focus on COVID-19, I'll mention it quite a bit um, since it's still constantly on our minds, isn't it? And speak directly to caregiving in the time of COVID later on in the presentation. So Barb has already stole my thunder. You know who I am and, and um, she shared with me a bit about who you are and I'm really delighted, I think, my interest in interprofessional education and geriatrics workforce make me passionate to talk to all types of clinicians and nurses across the spectrum in delivering care to older adults. So it's really uh, a pleasure to be here. And I'm really enthusiastic about age-friendly health systems and um, I'm delighted that since I gave this talk last year, there's really been uptake in implementation of age-friendly health systems nationally. Um, and if you haven't heard of it locally, I bet you will soon. Um, the Institute of Health Improvement, the John A. Hartford Foundation, American Hospital Association have really gotten a lot of momentum to support health systems for integrating this care. And, and the goal of age-friendly health systems, as you know, is to enhance the care of older adults by reliably implementing a set of four evidence-based elements known as the four M's um, to be able to assess and act upon um, the four M's in the delivery of care. In, in a lot of ways, it's simple, it can simplify the care of the most complex older adults. Um, and I use this beacon up top because I think if you keep these in mind, you can't really can't go wrong. And in this talk today, I challenge you not only to think about the four M's as it pertains to the older adult care recipient, but, but the, the four M's as it pertains to the caregiver, right? So what matters to the caregiver? Um, and thinking about the caregiver's issues that they are facing as they provide care, and then thinking together about the dyad and really leading with what matters most. And if we focus on what matters most to people and to the people who care for them, we really, um, are gonna provide uh, a really important service. And so I said that this topic is near to dear and dear to my heart. In fact, it is, and, and I'm gonna tell you why. This woman on the left, um, she's my grandma, Ann. I'm standing there with my grandpa, Morris. And grandma, Ann um, was this, an amazing woman. And, and, and most people would say if they heard about her life that, that she had a really hard life. And in fact, she did, she had a lot of challenges. 
Um, she actually lost two husbands uh, to an early death, um, one uh, very young of brain cancer, and the second was my mom's dad, uh, who died in his 40s of uh, cardiac disease, leaving her to raise my mom and two brothers um, on her own. And uh, she was an amazing mom herself. And uh, in her 50s, when they were all grown and out of the house, um, she started getting developing signs of Parkinson's disease. Um, and it progressed, um, you know, at a quite a young age compared to an average. And when my mom and dad, they're in the center of that picture, uh, got married, she needed help and she moved in with them. And so when I was born, Grandma Ann lived in the house that I grew up in and she was there my entire childhood. And um, I witnessed the caregiving of uh, my mom, her daughter, and then also like, and very specially my dad, who was her son-in-law, who never questioned the um, idea of caring for his mother-in-law um, and uh, really provided uh, just exceptional care to her. Um, and while yes, the um, idea of caring for my grandmother changed some of the things my family did. Um, we didn't go on a lot of very far vacations. We didn't um, maybe go out as much as other families, um, especially as she grew older and developed uh, more mobility issues and more mentation issues as she developed uh, dementia related to Parkinson's disease, um, I would say that I uh, couldn't be more grateful of the caregiving experience as I lived it. And um, uh, the idea of having uh, um, an older adult in, in the home where I grew up in really made uh, our life center around our family, for which I'm extraordinarily grateful. And uh, there is absolutely no question in my mind that I went into medicine and that I went into a specialty in geriatrics um, because of not only Grandma Ann, but the, the care that my parents gave her. My brother's a physical therapist and he would say exactly the same thing. And so um, for this reason, I just feel especially honored to talk about this topic today. So these are the questions that I hope to answer by the end of the talk. Who are the dementia caregivers? What challenges do they face? And how do we support dementia caregivers through their caregiving journey? Who are the dementia caregivers? We'll talk a little bit about definitions, terminology, language, and, and why language matters. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of the demographics and numbers. So terminology first, what, what's a caregiver anyway? Well, there, there are a lot of definitions, but I like um, these uh, and this uh, way of looking at it um, um, that is by the Family Caregiver Alliance. And today we're gonna be talking about the, the, the family or informal caregiver. And by definition, this is any relative partner, friend or neighbor who has significant personal relationship with and provides a broad range of assistance for an older person or an older adult with chronic or disabling condition. Now, important part here is that these individuals may be primary or secondary caregivers, and they may live with or separately from the person receiving care. So as I talk about the caregiver today, they don't by definition have to live with the care recipient which is the term we use for the person receiving care. And, and I think that comes up a lot um, because there are certain um, issues that we need to think about uh, for the caregiver, even if, even if they don't live with the person receiving care. I would uh, describe myself and other clinicians as formal caregivers. Um, and so that's a provider associated with a formal service system, whether a paid worker or a volunteer. And since we're talking about dementia caregiving today, I think it's important to think about the words we use. And I'm gonna encourage you, uh, many of you probably do this already, but I'm gonna encourage you when talking about a person with dementia to uh, use the terms a person or people with dementia, a person or people living with dementia, or a person or people with a diagnosis of dementia, if that's appropriate. And this is opposed to some terms I recommend not using. Um, which is uh, a person who suffers from or afflicted with dementia, that, that's a judgment term and not ours um, to judge. Um, senile, pre-senile, these are outdated words and demented um, is uh, not an appropriate word, even though you will see it written and you will see it spoken about in clinical settings all of the time. 
uh, avoid slang expressions that can be derogatory, like not all there, uh, delightfully dotty, a uh, few cu cups short uh, of a tea set. Um, uh, what, what else do I hear commonly? Um, uh, pleasantly demented. Uh, somebody really thinks that they're doing the right thing by using that term. And in fact, um, again, let's talk, let's focus on uh, the terms in this dark green box instead. And uh, it, it's the first challenge is for you to uh, use these terms yourself, the, the, um, the, the appropriate terms. The second challenge is to call someone else out when they, um, when, when they uh, use some of the terms here in the light green box. Uh, the final one that's hardest for me um, is to not call these folks patients. Um, even though in the clinical exam room that may be appropriate when we're talking outside of the exam room, these are people, they, they are not patients and it's important for us to remember that. And so similarly, um, this isn't specifically related to caregivers, but something I'd like to include in my talks if I can, because I think it's really important. It, it's the idea of the language we use when, when talking about the aging population and older adults in general. Um, I'm sure that if I could see your hands and ask who's heard of the term silver tsunami as a way to describe the aging population, I, I would see many of your hands go up. It's super common. Um, the tidal wave of older adults, the, the silver tsunami is coming our way. And this is, these are catastrophic terms, right? What, what happens when a tsunami comes? You run the other way. Um, and, um, and, and we recommend trying to, uh, I think that that terminology is in fact ageist. Um, you know, widespread negative assumptions about getting old have led public to take a fatalistic stance. There's not much to be done about aging, so we'll just run away. Um, but instead to talk affirmatively about changing demographics as Americans live longer and healthier lives, or to use um, uh, the, the sort of build, building momentum metaphor to reframe some of the ideas of aging. Aging is a dynamic process that leads to new abilities and knowledge that we can share with our communities. Just try some of those out. Um, and then we can spend a whole hour, if we wanted to, talking about what older people should be called or want to be called. Um, and there is some evidence, um, although you'll find people with lots of different opinions, um, that, that we should try to avoid terms like seniors, elderly, or aging dependents, um, because they stoke certain stereotypes. Um, I prefer older adults, um, as the Journal of American Geriatric Society does as well, and actually requires us to use that term when we're publishing, um, or elders, I, I happen to, to think is uh, a nice term and really uh, uh, engenders a lot of respect. Um, but there are a lot, I just want to say there are a lot of opinions about this. Um, and that generally speaking, we want to try to use more neutral and more inclusive terms. So instead of talking about those old people, right, those older people, the aging population, it's, it's them, right? Actually, it's all of us, right? We're all getting older. And so if we use the inclusive we and us in our terminology, uh, I think it can be really powerful. And, and sort of leads to kind of this whole idea of a strength-based approach to dementia care that I'll talk a lot about today. And in fact, in 2015 uh, of uh, the University of Washington Nursing School, um, there was this article that really started people, it wasn't the first time, but I think uh, was in the early uh, years of focusing on dementia friendly, dementia capable, and dementia positive comments to um, uh, promote better dementia care in general. And out of some of these ideas have come some really neat um, programs and um, Momentia is one of them. And if you look at momentiaseattle.com, it's a local um, uh, website um, that curates uh, experiences and activities for people with dementia and their caregivers. Now, a lot of these are, are virtual these days. Um, we're all looking forward to the, the days when we can gather um, safely again in larger groups. And, um, uh, and, and, and uh, MomentiaSeattle.org is a place that has a lot of uh, opportunities um, for 
ways to keep people with dementia engaged um, and social and safe. And those are really some of the most important things we can do to support a person with dementia and their caregiver. And so who are the dementia caregivers? Um, well, one of the things to think about is that most of the help provided to older people in the U.S. comes from family, friends, and other unpaid caregivers. It's, it's tremendous. Um, and about half of the care um, that's provided to older people um, who need help are people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. So, so that's a common reason why people um, have functional um, decline that, that, that results in them needing help. Um, and like I said, a lot of, um, it's more than 16 million in, in 2020 statistics of Americans provided uncare, unpaid care uh, for people with Alzheimer's and other dementias. And this is um, reflective of a, a society, I think, that doesn't focus enough on uh, both financially and socially supporting people with dementia and their caregivers. And I'll say that again when we talk a little bit about the economic impact of dementia caregiving, but it's really important that we advocate um, for this issue. And um, uh, just by, by statistics, about two thirds of the dementia caregivers are women. And so why, why are we talking about this anyway? Why are we here today? Well, it turns out that um, people are living longer in general and, and it, COVID may actually change some of the statistics, but in general, people are living longer. And the reason people are living longer is we're, we're doing better at treating heart disease and treating, uh, treating cancers, right? So treating heart disease and cancers, people are living longer. Um, and as people live longer, their risk goes up for al Alzheimer's disease specifically. Um, it's one of the biggest risk factors of Alzheimer's disease is age. So as people live longer, the, the higher the, the chance that they um, will get um, Alzheimer's dementia. And uh, in fact, a survey of primary care physicians found that, that we're expecting this, right? 90% of um, PCPs expect to see an increase in people living with dementia um, over the next five years, but, but only half of them think our profession is prepared to meet this demand. And so that, that's really telling, right? That's really telling. And that's why I feel really passionate um, to teach people about dementia and to teach people about caring for people with dementia um, because this is unacceptable. We need to be prepared um, because we need to do better. We need to do right by people. Um, and I think when people don't feel prepared in the care of certain conditions, they, they don't do a good job of providing that care. And so let me introduce you to Miss Jones and her daughter, Vera. Um, these, uh, they're, they're my patients at Swedish Family Medicine First Hill, but this is not their picture. Um, and these are not their names. I've changed their names, but they are in fact, um, it's, it's a real story and they're real people. And um, uh, Vera is, uh, works at a local hospital um, and uh, Ms. Jones is um, in the middle stage of her um, dementia related to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and she's needing more care. Um, and Vera recently cut down uh, a, a bit on her hours at work. And she thinks she, she might need to cut back more because what she's doing now is she's um, leaving um, Miss Jones her food and her medications out uh, before she leaves for work. Um, but she's worried that she's not always taking the medicine she leaves out. She's not eating and drinking enough. And there's some concern that she may wander. They don't have other family close by. Um, and in fact, uh, Vera's concerned that even if um, uh, Miss Jones would allow her to hire caregivers, which she's very not very thrilled about that, um, Vera's a little concerned about how she's going to pay for it. Um, and this is a very close mother-daughter dyad. Um, Miss Jones raised Vera as a single mom. Um, they've always been kind of their closest people to each other. And so when Ms. Jones started needing support or care. There's no question that Vera was going to be the person providing that for her. And so we've talked a little bit about the dementia caregivers. Well, what challenges do they face? And I like to think of this as the dimensions of dementia caregiving. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the economic, the physical, the emotional, 
impacts of caregiving for the caregiver, and then just this concept of distress versus rewards. Um, so back to the four M's, um, let's think about the uh, four M's as they relate to the care needs of people progressing in dementia. And we'll talk about a lot of these things in more detail as we go along, but just sort of getting our brains around, like, what is it that the dementia caregiver needs to provide? And it starts with really the, the IADLs. Maybe at first they're just helping them balance the checkbook or um, helping, uh, helping transport them around um, and um, providing their meals. Um, but then as the dementia progresses and the mobility uh, um, changes, then uh, the, the care gets much more physical, right? Uh, the caregiver has to help a lot more with physical um, caregiving tasks like uh, transporting to the bathroom or helping transfer um, or uh, bathing or helping their loved one eat. Um, and along the way, other things um, need to be um, addressed as well. Medications can be a safety issue. We'll talk about that later. And so medication administration and supervision. Managing medical appointments, um, managing the behavioral changes or symptoms that can come in the middle stage of dementia. We'll talk a lot about that uh, later on in this talk. And then while there are lots of resources, we're lucky locally here in Seattle for support of dementia caregivers, they're not always easy to find. And so navigating those services and considering um, the location for care or caregiving um, and planning for the future um, so that really, you know, to do it well, that caregivers always thinking about what matters most, right, to, to the person with dementia and to the family and really helping that uh, guide, guide the caregiving itself. Um, but it's not easy, right? It's challenging. There are a lot of challenges that come along the way. Uh, economic being one of them. Um, so, um, from the Alzheimer's Facts and Figures um, 2020, uh, a large percent, 69% of caregivers suffered lost wages um, and health insurance and other job benefits that affect their finances now. But if the caregiving goes on for a long period of time where they can't work, that also affects their caregiving, their, sorry, their finances later on, like social security benefits and retirement savings. Um, and there's some statistics that show a lot of caregivers quit their jobs or reduce their work hours um, because of their caregiving responsibilities. And that's going to affect um, their income as well. And about 50%, around 50% of caregivers by, by the statistics provided in the um, Alzheimer's Facts and Figures 2020 showed that average annual household income of less than $50,000 for people providing this care. And so um, working less um, is a big deal. And look at the unpaid care. This is locally in Washington, but there are statistics for, for all states. Um, 402 million hours of unpaid care, um, 5.2 million dollars of unpaid care. And it's in the billions of dollars when we think about it nationally. Um, this is, again, uh, this is not okay, right? I mean, we have people that are, um, that need support, both sort of that social support in terms of caregiving, but the real financial support. And unless in this state of Washington, at least, unless you're poor enough to qualify for Medicaid, um, you, you don't have access to paid caregiving. And that's a big problem. The physical health. So there are some studies that show uh, worse, uh, just generally worse health outcomes for, for all caregivers and that dementia caregivers are more likely to have more infectious episodes um, thought to be sort of related to some of the stress and the inflammation immune function that come, come from caregiving. And of course, like when you're in the middle of an infectious disease, um, COVID-19 pandemic, like this is a big deal. We need to keep our caregivers healthy. Um, and in fact, um, a lot of caregivers put off care um, because they are so focused on uh, the dementia caregiving itself. 
Um, but other studies are, aren't so um, worrisome. They're actually positive, suggesting that caregiving can have a positive effect on keeping especially older caregivers more physically active than non-caregivers. From an emotional perspective, um, depression is a common diagnosis in caregivers and happens to be more common um, for people who perform more intense physical caregiving and then also when behavioral symptoms present. This tends to be people can be like coping really well and then these behavioral symptoms come and that's so emotionally taxing on the caregiver, which is one of the reasons we'll put a real emphasis on this uh, during this talk and um, make sure you understand how we can provide support for caregivers when these behavioral symptoms present. Um, and then another just really interesting um, fact um, is that there looks like there is a, a correlation, I don't know if it's a causation, of spousal risk of dementia. So if you are caring for your spouse with dementia and they die, the spouse has an increased risk themselves. In one study, um, it showed up to six times increased risk of developing dementia. And, and this is in, even after the, the, the um, spouse who they were providing care for dies. Um, and there's real suggestion that maybe the caregiving itself can change uh, like neuropathologic changes. And I think there's, we need to study this more, but um, something to think about when you're providing care for a person with dementia and their caregiver spouse. And while what I just shared with you is kind of heavy, right? There's like a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, data that's concerning related to caregivers. Um, I think that especially my um, situation uh, um, where there's just so much sort of like honor and um, uh, positive thoughts that go along with the caregiving, um, I think that exists for a lot of people as well. And, um, and, we, and and so, so then one of the questions is how do we help people? You know, it's not that we can make all of the difference, but in providing care for people, we can help kind of emphasize some of the positive aspects of caregiving and help create sort of the conditions in which positive caregiving can take place. And so this study kind of explored that and I really, I really uh, appreciate it. Um, it speaks to the positive aspects of caregiving uh, under four key domains, a, a personal accomplishment, um, a mutuality in the dyadic relationship, a cohesion in the family, and a personal sense of growth and purpose. And that we can help people by trying to um, sh trying to help them um, with sort of in these, um, make these conditions one that they experience. So a personal and social affirmation of role fulfillment, uh, effective cognitive emotional regulation. And so when I think about that, I think of coping and what we can do to provide support for caregivers so they can cope better. And then helping them find meaning, meaning in the caregiver experience. And so um, there are a number of different tools to assess the dementia caregiver. Um, and if you are caring for people with dementia, it, it may be you who are the first healthcare professional to detect strain or burden or challenge in the person who's providing the care. That Because that person may not be, like we said, going to their, um, their own healthcare appointments. And so it's really an opportunity for us uh, to prevent kind of some of the distress that can come um, with caregiving by routinely screening and looking for signs and providing support. So um, it's really important that we don't assume there's burden. And I, I, I say that because one of the tools I like is the Zareet burden interview. Um, I actually wish that they just, they didn't use the term burden. This caregiver self-assessment questionnaire is more, um, I would say, uh, um, it, it, you know, it doesn't have a judgment in it like burden, but, but you know, the, the idea is that we look for, for places that, that we can provide support. Um, and, and instead of caregiver burden or caregiver strain, I like to think about the term as caregiver experience. 
Um, and so that's uh, something that I encourage you to think about as well. Um, and really, it's our duty to, to screen people. So, it, you know, it doesn't matter, honestly, what tool you use unless you're doing a research study and you need to um, use a certain validated in, um, instrument. When we're in uh, uh, clinical care, uh, we use tools to help us ask the right questions. And, um, and th these two, two are, are some of the tools I like the best. So back to Vera and Ms. Jones. Um, like I said, um, Vera um, was worried about her finances, especially when she cut back on work. Um, and, um, you know, from a physical health perspective, um, I am lucky as a, a family physician to, to not only care for uh, Ms. Jones, but care for Vera as well. And so I always encouraged her to make an appointment for herself on the same day she was bringing Ms. Jones in. And uh, we are managing her um, dementia, sorry, not her dementia, Vera's diabetes and hypertension. You have to wonder if um, any of the stressors in her life put her at more risk for those conditions. Um, and then from an emotional health perspective, Vera has a support of a really strong faith community. And um, she has, um, I think, like used her people when things have gotten um, difficult for her um, and she's coping really well. And, and you know, like I mentioned, um, before, you know, from a distress rewards, like Vera's in a, a good position, like she um, feels a lot of meaning in caring for her mom. She feels um, a lot of uh, gratitude for that, um, uh, for, to, to be able to do that for her mom. And I think that's really protective in, in her experience. Um, so this year, the Lancet came out, actually it was is last fall, um, with their pre dementia prevention, intervention, and care report. Um, I encourage you to look at it because it has a lot of really good nuggets, um, specifically in what we can do to prevent dementia in midlife, which um, is, is uh, super interesting um, and important because we don't have disease modifying treatments or agents um, for dementia yet. Uh, but what they, they have a section specifically about caregiving and um, they reported that caregiver distress was lo uh, closely linked to neuropsychiatric symptoms. Like I've mentioned already, some of those behavioral symptoms can really, really be sort of the tipping point um, for people providing dementia care. And they highlight um, the need to effectively identify, educate, and support caregivers. Uh, I'll, I'll say that they write to support distressed caregivers, but I would suggest that they write uh, to support caregivers before distress. That's ultimately what we want to do. Um, and they speak to one particular intervention that was a manual-based coping intervention delivered by um, supervised psychology graduates. Um, and this this is interesting because we have psychology graduate students in our um, interprofessional geriatric assessment clinic I'll mention later on. Um, and they found that this intervention with the caregiver really um, impacted depressive symptoms in caregivers. And so that's, um, they suggest that we look at other programs that can make this impact. And I'll mention a couple other programs later on. So we've talked about the dementia caregivers and we've talked about the challenges they face Next, after um, a, a meditation that we're gonna do together, uh, we're gonna talk about how we support dementia caregivers in the caregiver journey. I will say that this is five minutes long and um, that um, if you'd rather go and stretch your legs or, or get a drink of water, please feel free to do that. That's the beautiful thing about Zoom webinars, I'll never know. But I do encourage you to, to, to enjoy this meditation and um, and that this is actually specifically a meditation for caregivers. Deep breathing. Breathing deeply is a quick way to relax. You can do it almost any place and time you need to relieve stress. Deep breathing helps maintain a sense of calm and it's part of almost all relaxation and meditation techniques. Thanks. 
The key is to breathe deeply from your abdomen rather than shallowly from your lungs and get as much fresh air and oxygen into your lungs as possible. Begin by sitting or lying down in a comfortable position. Close your eyes softly. Put one hand on your stomach and the other on your chest if possible. Feel your breathing for a short time, noticing the rise and fall of your stomach. Breathe in, inhale deeply through your nose. As you breathe in, the hand on your stomach should rise and the one on your chest should move very little. Breathe out, exhale through your mouth. Push out as much air as you can and feel your stomach tighten as it flattens. Again, the hand on your stomach should move, but your chest shouldn't move much. Be sure that you empty out all the air and then pause. Try to inhale to the count of 10. And then exhale to the count of 10. This helps to slow your breathing. Repeat this breathing for several minutes. If you're lying down, you can put a small book on your stomach and try to breathe so that it rises when you inhale and falls when you exhale. When you are ready, you can open your eyes. All right, who knew that was so perfectly placed in terms of the timing? <laughs> Um, Barb, can I take a remote control? Um, can I give that a try and then I can... Um, 
we're not. Yeah, I don't think you can take over remote control, but if you want to, you can start sharing your slides again. No, let, let's not just because okay, I, I- So then just let me know when to advance. Perfect, on to the next slide. So um, this is sort of my favorite part of the talk, really talking about specifically how we can support dementia caregivers along the dementia care journey. And we'll go from diagnosis to end of life and grieving. And I'll be highlighting um, a tool, uh, the Dementia Roadmap, which I'll talk about in the next slide. So the Dementia Action Collaborative um, is Washington State's sort of response to dementia and how we are going to uh, approach it. Um, and it's a public-private partnership that really has, uh, and I can speak to this personally this year, since last year when I gave this talk, I've actually joined the Dementia Action Collaborative. I'm very um, excited and honored to do so. And one of their tools um, that they create is this dementia roadmap, and I absolutely love it. Um, it is a beautiful photo um, that, um, and then inside, um, very clear um, action steps and symptoms to look for in every stage um, of dementia. And I encourage you, if you don't live in the state of Washington, to look at your own state's dementia plan. Um, and if you do live in the state of Washington, I encourage you not just to access this online, but it's even better in, um, in brochure form, which I give um, to all of my patients uh, if I make a diagnosis of dementia or I'm caring for them with dementia. Next slide, please. So starting with the diagnosis. Um, there are lots of reasons, um, but what we know is that dementia is often the de delayed in diagnosis. Um, when somebody um, has a new diagnosis of dementia, they've probably by statistics um, had, had dementia for several years. Um, and not only is dementia, um, the delay in diagnosis common, but even when the diagnosis is made and there's a diagnosis of dementia in the chart, um, in, um, in studies, uh, uh, fewer in this one big study that was done, fewer than half of Medicare beneficiaries who actually have a diagnosis of dementia, um, Alzheimer's or another dementia, actually report that they do so. And it's not just that they have dementia and don't remember because their caregiver or their uh, family is asked as well. And so the dementia diagnosis is actually not given to the person with dementia and their family. And what, like, what's the problem? Well, um, there are missed opportunities to not just get the diagnosis, but also get support. And that's what we'll be talking about. You know, what, what can we do to provide support? Um, and then there's missed opportunities to plan for the future. It's really early in the stages of dementia that people can have the biggest impact, a person with dementia, in, when they, um, in saying what they want in, for the future uh, in terms of their, their um, health care um, while they still have the capacity to be able to do so. And, and uh, if we delay in the diagnosis too much, we may miss our opportunities. And also, we know but from the time of diagnosis, what we are hoping we can do and what I am uh, encouraging us to do as a community is to integrate um, the clinical care that we give in the office to community-based supports and, and none better than the Alzheimer's Association, um, which is underutilized and um, really wonderful in terms of being able to support uh, people with dementia in all stages from early to end stage um, and to provide uh, really hands-on support in a lot of ways for caregivers that I'll, I'll mention too as we go on. Next slide, please. So um, after we make the diagnosis, what do we do? Um, well, I can tell you that it, it's not uncommon for people to get a diagnosis of dementia. They are sent on their way and told back to come back in six months. And sometimes they're given a medicine and sometimes they aren't. Um, but that's obviously not what we wanna do. 
um, from uh, the early stages of dementia, we want to really engage with people with dementia and their care partners to answer their questions. And, and this, these are some questions that are suggested for people with early stage dementia in that dementia roadmap. Um, and they're great questions, and I think they're a really good starting place for, for how we can provide support and management in early stages of dementia. Uh, first, uh, medications. Like, first of all, the biggest question you have in early dementia is, are there medicines to treat this? And um, we could have a whole nother talk on the medications we use in dementia. Um, they help a, a little bit. Some of the people, some of the time, um, we do um, offer medications uh, when a diagnosis of dementia is made, um, but we also have to be realistic in what to expect from those medications and then also um, be looking out for potential um, side effects or harms of the medication. But what else, right? We want to look um, for other treatment or lifestyle changes that can help support a person with dementia. Um, I have that little heart and brain there to remind us that heart health and brain health are really connected. That if we can treat um, and manage, for instance, heart disease and hypertension at early stage dementia, we may be able to prevent the progression. For instance, if somebody had a stroke when they've already had a diagnosis of dementia, it's likely that they'll progress more quickly. So we wanna prevent that. We wanna provide a person with dementia and their caregiver the ability to have safe, engaged, um, and um, uh, opportunities to do meaningful activities to them. And it may not be so obvious how to do that, and we need to provide that support. Um, I saw that there are a driving lecture or a topic earlier in this series, um, one of the most difficult things. And we need to be asking about driving, um, especially with a new and early diagnosis of dementia. Um, people with dementia in early stages can drive. Um, uh, maybe, sometimes, um, and uh, a diagnosis to, of dementia doesn't mean people can't drive, but it means that they may be at risk for unsafe driving and we need to be able to um, assess, evaluate, and make recommendations um, or make referrals if we need to. It is really on us as the healthcare provider and the healthcare community to sort of take that burden off of a family member to um, uh, to, to, to make that call. And I like to use the term driving retirement because again, it takes some of the negative or judgment out of it as opposed to giving up driving or taking away the keys. We talk early and often about driving retirement so people are prepared uh, when the time comes. And then of course, in early stage dementia, we want to uh, discuss advanced care planning. We want to talk about um, advanced directives. We want to make sure that somebody gets to name a health proxy um, while they still have the capacity to do so. We want to talk in detail if, if it's appropriate about the type of care that they would want at the end of their life, the setting that they want to be at the end of the life, their life. And we want to ask these things in the early stages if we can. Next slide, please. Moving to the middle stage of dementia, this is the dementia where we, this is the stage of dementia where we think about safety. Um, this is the stage where we think that maybe um, somebody may need some more supervision, even if it's just uh, in terms of taking their medications, are they able to do that safely? Um, and this is um, the stage where we start seeing some of the behavioral symptoms that I talked about. And in terms of the behavioral symptoms, we need to have our uh, clinical teams um, uh, able and ready to answer questions when the caregiver calls and says, my mom is, is acting different, um, she's very anxious, she's pacing, what do I do? And this is the stage that we can provide a lot of support and so can the, uh, um, the Alzheimer's Association um, as well as other caregiver support um, organizations that we'll talk about. This is the time where we're going to revisit advanced care planning. I feel like a bit of a broken record, but it's really just that important. And we're going to ask again if they're still driving um, and assess for driving safety. Moving on to late stage dementia. This is the stage where caregiving gets more physical. And without Medicaid, to get help for caregiving can be very expensive. And I just put some 
some I'm sure a lot of you are aware, but some may not be aware of the actual costs of caregiving. And these may vary across the country, but um, they're pretty accurate, if not on the lower side in my experience. So this is the stage we, we want to think about how to support uh, somebody, especially support the um, dementia caregiver and the person with dementia if they want to keep that person at home. We need to do what we can to make that possible. Um, we need to think about medication deprescribing. Um, this is actually just as a geriatrician, one of the most um, rewarding things I do is deprescribe medications. Um, and in fact, I um, had a, a telephone visit just an hour before this um, talk with a uh, the daughter of a patient, a person, sorry, thank you, a person with late stage dementia who's on hospice, and she's still on um, two blood pressure medications, and she's uh, not moving around very much. And so we talked about deprescribing those medications and how important that is just in terms of the pill burden and, and what she needs to swallow. Um, deprescribing.org is a website that I recommend. Um, it's really fabulous. And um, there's some data and some studies on that site um, that show that, that, that say that many uh, people with dementia and their caregivers are, are really, really thrilled uh, when their um, care providers recommend um, consideration of deprescribing of medications. And so um, that is uh, something that, that should be considered really through all stages um, and really in all people when appropriate, but even more important. Uh, important at the in the later stages of dementia. Respite care I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, and again, uh, making sure those advanced care planning documents are complete, revisited, and in place. Um, so respite care um, in the next slide uh, is a service where another trained person or staff um, uh, provide planned short-term care uh, while the caregiver um, takes care of whatever they need to do. And um, there uh, are local opportunities for this and they're probably different in all of our different areas, but locally, um, the Family Caregiver Support Program, the King County Caregiver Support Network um, administer this program. And I think it's really under known and underutilized um, and really important for a variety of reasons where the caregiver might need a break. Um, and uh, in the end of life with um, Alzheimer's and other dementias, uh, we need to think about what setting is desired and practical. Um, if it's clear and well known um, where the person with dementia would like to spend the end of their life and it's practical to do so, we want to do everything we can to make that happen. Um, and in fact, over the last 20 years, less Alzheimer's patients or people died um, in nursing homes and facilities um, and more of them died at home. And I think that's likely because of the increased um, hospice um, supports. And um, hospice is amazing. Hospice is uh, really important. Uh, for people with dementia and their caregivers, but it's really important that we remind people that hospice does not provide 24-hour care. So while hospice can be a wonderful layer of support, it can coach caregivers through the end of life, symptoms and medications and, and grief and many other wonderful things, they do not provide 24-hour care. And it's very important that we remind people of that. Um, and that in, in dementia, that the end of life, um, I would say unlike typical in like cancer, for instance, in dementia, the end of life can last a really, really long time and intensive physical supports are needed over those long periods of time. So we need to set people up to be able to do the care um, uh, over a long period of time. And that's unique, um, I would say, to dementia. And so next slide, um, when the person with dementia dies, um, it's really important that we don't just assume that it's relief uh, uh, um, from the caregiver's part. And I don't think any of us really do, but, um, but uh, that the, the, this article from last year um, was really neat. It looked at, um, uh, specifically dementia caregiver grief and what 
uh, when the positive grief experiences were um, noted and negative grief experiences and what went into that. And so I think if we know this, we can really help try to promote and support positive grief experiences. And so they include um, the ability to construct positive memories, um, to, the ability to see that the death is the end of suffering, and to make sure there's relationship resolution. Um, and negative grief experiences we can try to avoid by avoiding seeing the um, decline as traumatic, um, by seeing the caregiver role as a loss, um, by having unavailable support. And I put a star there because this is, I think, where we can really help um, and then help the caregiver imagine kind of what would a new life look like. Okay, next slide. Um, so we're gonna talk about a couple, a few model programs for persons with dementia and their caregivers. And I wanna come back to this concept of the dementia caregiver and the person with dementia right at the middle. And what we wanna do and what these programs do so well is design care for people with dementia by moving away from an approach that focuses on the loss of abilities due to dementia and approaches um, and towards an approach that emphasizes the individual's unique needs, personal experiences, and strengths. And so next slide. So the first program I wanna talk about um, is um, this program, the UCLA Dementia Care Program. This is um, a program that um, is uh, amazing and it is, um, David Rubin is the geriatrician that leads the program. Um, and it has a lot of great evidence in terms of supporting caregivers, um, limiting hospitalizations and, and um, affecting uh, both the well-being of the person with the um, dementia and caregivers. And while we may not all have uh, access to this um, program, we do have access to these really amazing caregiver training videos that are on its website. So I really encourage you to take this down. And um, like I said, one of the hardest things to do when you're supporting a person with dementia and their caregiver is responding to their concerns about the behavioral symptoms that can come in the middle stages of dementia. And these are exactly the challenges. And these are really great five-ish minute videos on the different symptoms and suggesting ways to approach. And so if the person doesn't, hasn't um, you know, been referred to the Alzheimer's Association or doesn't have care, uh, focused caregiver support, you can send them the links to these videos. And I'm just looking at the time, Barb. Um, I think that um, we'll skip the videos, um, but you guys can look online and I, I really encourage you because they're very inspiring and in how people talk about the um, the, the care from these programs. Next slide, please. So the next program that I want to talk about um, is uh, the Dementia Care Ecosystem. It is started at UCSF and is now in multiple different settings. Um, and I will contrast these two programs by telling you that the UCLA Dementia Care Program is administered or uh, um, the focus is about giving the right care to the right people at the right time. And they have um, they have a, an uh, advanced care practitioner, usually a nurse practitioner, who's a specialist in dementia care, pairing with a primary care provider to provide the support for the person with dementia and their caregiver. So that's the UCLA program. In this UCSF program, you can see in the middle, um, the patient caregiver dyad, and um, they are paired with a care team navigator. And the cool thing about this, this is a trained lay person. And oftentimes it's a, grad, a college graduate that's waiting to go on to um, grad school. And they go over, and I'll show you in the next slide, they go over a, um, a curriculum with um, people with the, with the caregivers to help promote their ability to help care um, for the, uh, their person with dementia. The cool thing about the care team navigators is there's some data that shows that after they 
finish playing this role in this program, they often go on to careers in taking care um, or careers in aging and taking care of older people, which I thought was really cool. So this is also available to everybody. It's an open access uh, materials from the dementia care ecosystem in multiple different languages, which is amazing, um, that uh, go through different topics that they uh, address with um, the caregivers. And so I really encourage you to take a look at that and, and to watch the video on the website too, because it's really inspiring. Next slide. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has a care consultation program where they will send um, a nurse typically to the house to assess needs, to assist with care planning and problem solving, and just to be there to support and um, really underutilized service. Next slide. So a uh, shout out to the University of Washington Memory and Brain Wellness Center. Absolute expert, robust interprofessional services um, and links to research opportunities for patients. So if you don't know about them and locally, link, they are um, state of the art really in providing um, interprofessional based services to people with dementia and caregivers. And I am um, lucky enough, you heard Barb talk a little bit about um, in providing a service at Swedish where um, we provide a, a comprehensive geriatric assessment with an interprofessional team, um, which is really my favorite thing to do is work in the context of a team. And in, in, in those visits, there's an individual session with the caregiver at the time the person with dementia is getting cognitive testing where we would naturally split them apart. And you can see this picture, everyone's got their favorite COVID Zoom picture. This is one of our, our um, team um, providing um, care fully uh, remote through Zoom. We're doing um, options for people. We have, we're doing it in person and via Zoom or actually telephone as well, um, which has been uh, a challenge, but really a neat opportunity during COVID. Um, a whole talk could be made on dementia caregiving in the time of COVID-19. I encourage you to look at this New York Times article. Um, just a few things that I think are really important um, right now, I'll say. Um, vaccinating our folks that are like mostly homebound is super, super challenging and I'm really passionate about it and excited to think about how we can do this better. Um, the In Seattle, the fire department is going uh, to adult family homes and vaccinating folks and um, we're thinking about ways to continue to make sure of that and to also make sure that the caregiver is vaccinated as well. Um, advanced care planning is critical in the time of COVID for obvious reasons, one of which is being in the hospital can be so traumatic uh, during these times. And it is my opinion that during the entire COVID-19 pandemic, we, we should have and sometimes have um, when, when done appropriately thought of the care, dementia caregiver as the essential personnel. They, they need to be in there um, regardless of the diagnosis when a person with dementia is admitted to the hospital. Um, and next slide. Um, in terms of our, um, you know, this past year has also been a call to action in terms of equity um, and in terms of racial equity in providing health care. And um, I think one of the ways to get to equity is to is to study things. And, and so this is um, on the left and our um, uh, research study looking specifically at Latino caregivers. Um, and on the right, these are materials um, reminding us that African Americans have a higher risk of Alzheimer's disease and a higher chance of a delayed diagnosis. And it's really a call to action. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, there's this this uh, paper from 2020 um, was really neat and and just you know reminds us in terms of taking care uh, of the black community and uh, the people with dementia and dementia caregivers in the black community um, that racism um, and discrimination is. Um, uh, has a long history and hasn't gone away, and that can really affect trust building. And that this particular article really spoke to how family and friends um, can play a big role in the, uh, the dementia caregiver's um, life and experience. And that we have to think when we're taking care of all uh, BIPOC communities that structural and institutional issues um, related to diagnosis and care 
are critical. I mean, and this has come up so um, significantly during the time of COVID and again, in, in issues of vaccine equity. Um, but also I want us to think about the need to tailor caregiver interventions um, based on caregiver preferences um, and with um, structural and institutional inequities uh, in mind. Next, please. So Vera, um, so Vera um, and Ms. Jones. So, so Vera left her job um, and for an entire year, she took care of Ms. Jones at home 24 seven, the last five months of which um, hospice was involved and Vera had a really neat relationship with the hospice nurse. Um, for two weeks out of that last year, um, Vera had a health emergency herself um, and we were able to get um, Ms. Jones um, respite care, and then Vera went back to, uh, to care for her. And um, gratefully, because um, that's what she wanted, uh, Ms. Jones died comfortably at home. And, um, and I think what I'll really never forget, because Vera's my patient and I still see her, is the profound grief and sadness that she had when her mom died. And this is in a situation where she, um, you know, felt so good about the care she could give. And so um, I just really uh, felt honored to um, witness that and to be part of that. Um, next slide. And so hopefully if I've done my job, we've talked about who the dementia caregivers are, the challenges they face and how we can support them through their caregiver journey. And next slide. Um, and while we don't have disease modifying treatments for dementia, our role as an interprofessional team of caregivers treating a person with dementia and their caregiver is critical. And so, um, Thank you for letting me be here. One of the things you can do uh, if you enjoyed this talk is next time you go outside on a beautiful clear day with the blue sky and sunshine, think of Grandma Ann. Um, she, despite some of the challenges in her life, she would go outside even if she needed two people to walk around the block and she would look up and say, it's a great to be alive day. And so if you can say it's a great to be alive day and think of Grandma Ann, I would very much appreciate that. And I am, um, open and happy to take your questions now. Thank you so much. I, I love the conclusion there. Um, I'll be thinking about that for weeks on end now. <laughs> um, we do have one question and it's a great one. And this is someone who's wondering, um, what are the, what is your sense of the costs of respite care? Oh, um, so I believe, and please, if other people uh, listening know, can chat in, ch chat in. Uh, at least locally, there are some funds to pay. So, so I do know that I'm pretty sure that Medicaid will pay for respite care and that there are some community supports. Again, if you get people to the right spot to actually pay through the Family Caregiver Support Program locally. Um, and so otherwise, the answer is it's very expensive. And, um, and that's important to understand. Um, do you have a sense um, about um, primary care providers um, who believe there will be adequate numbers um, to cover elder health versus those who don't? In other words, what are the differences between the two groups? And um, Mary, if you want to chat in a little bit more explanation about that, um, that would be helpful, but um, the question is about the breakdown of primary care providers. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that um, most people would say, you know, we, um, that they're, like, like I said, that, that those statistics show that they're expecting, like, internal medicine doctors and family medicine doctors are expecting to see more older patients because the population is aging. Um, and that um, about half of them, I, I don't, that's a really good question. So, so what are the, like maybe the characteristics or the care settings or the clinical settings that people may feel more sort of like supported and empowered um, to, to give dementia care. And I know that there's a lot to be done locally to 
train, including GWAC um, and including these kinds of series to prepare folks to be able to um, care for older people. Do you know how to identify providers, adult family home or memory care or home care agencies that specialize in difficult behaviors like mm. depression or extreme anxiety? <sighs> That's um, really, really tough. And so um, there are some, you know, agencies that help match um, needs and uh, one of them is called A Place for Mom, and the other is called K-Care. I'm not promoting them at all, um, but I do know that those are two uh, examples of some agencies. There are um, um, the Community Living Connections locally, and I don't know what it is for people who don't live in um, this area. They can, can, can help assess uh, and find um, settings that are appropriate. What I do know is that often when somebody's living at home and they need a care setting, um, they may want to look for assisted living, um, something that doesn't provide memory support. And it's really important that we think ahead and plan ahead because we, the thing we don't want to happen is for people to move to an assisted living facility and then to move again in a year or so if there are um, uh, um, symptoms um, or uh, care needs that exceed the place where they will be. Um, and I always recommend, and this has been much more difficult in the time of COVID, but now with vaccines taking off, um, go and see the place, of course, before, um, and, and just observe and see, see what it looks like in terms of the care provided. Great. Um, well, back to the question about costs. Lorraine mentions that in Wyoming, uh, respite care can be $125 to $225 a day for out of the home. Um, some counties have some funds to help pay for this, but it isn't much. And then Chris mentioned that the VA can pay for respite for caregivers of veterans if they're eligible, but there's no availability in contracted facilities. And mentions um, trying to coordinate respite for a couple of families for months with no success and mm. certainly as you mentioned making this harder for caregivers to access respite. Yeah thank you for that information. Um, so uh, I don't have any other questions I don't think let me just see here. I'm kind of fielding questions from multiple <laughs> sources. Um, um, I think that's it. I was asked about the, this is not related to your talk, but about the credit link for CME. And the link for CME is um, coming when you complete your attendance log or in the email that you would have received. Um, there is the link to CME. Um, oh, Kathy mentions that Montana has respite care funds available through the AAAs. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think um, I really appreciate this. I'm so sorry about the technical difficulties, Dr. Rubenstein, but it was a magnificent talk despite all of that. <laughs> I agree. We all kind of needed the, the uh, nice meditation. <laughs> A break. And I hope um, those of you who go to our website and pull down the handout will um, take a look at the other videos. Um, they're very helpful. This was uh, just great. And um, we will see everyone. Uh, March 30th is our next um, series startup. And the registration links should be coming out soon. Thank you so much. Really appreciate this talk. Thank you. It was uh, my pleasure and honor to be here. Sending out the links again one more second <clears throat> so you can pull them. All right. Have a nice spring break, everyone. <laughs>